Good morning, dear church family. Good morning once again. <laughs> Thanks for the prayers, Ange. Appreciate it very much. I thought this morning we could take a little break from 2 Samuel. It's rather heavy going, I understand, going through the Old Testament. There's many beautiful things there that remind us of Jesus, and there's, some many, there's many hard things too. And I thought for today we take a little break, and I wanted to address... Uh, a topic that is much misunderstood, even in the church, much misunderstood for sure in the world, and it's the, it's the subject of faith. What is faith after all? I want to talk about faith this morning. I felt that God would have me to do that. Faith is one of those words that um, people think they know what it means, but really they only have a, a shadowy, hazy sort of understanding. It's a, it's a little bit like time. If I, if I was to speak here about time, you know what I was talking about, but if I were to ask you, could you please define time for me? Not so easy. <laughs> and in our world, faith is one of those words that is terribly, terribly misunderstood, especially w with respect to Christian faith. I think it comes just under the word love. People don't know what love is anymore. We have to help them. The Bible will tell us what these things are. Today, we're looking at faith. We'll tackle love a different time. <laughs> under God. It's important because faith plays an essential role in where and how we're going to spend eternity. In Ephesians 2 verse 8 it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we may as well say this at the beginning of our service together, or at the beginning of the message, we are saved by grace through faith. That means we all came into the world guilty sinners. We were guilty in Adam. Adam sinned, the federal head of humanity, and we, uh, we were represented by that guy. And embryonically, spiritually, we were in Adam too. We fell when he fell. And we came into the world children of wrath, and we just kept adding to our sin debt. And Paul will tell us that we were enemies in our minds by wicked works. And not only were we enemies of God by wicked works in our minds, but we actually did wicked acts in the flesh. And God had every right to, to just consign us all to the lake of fire forever. I mean, that's the just punishment for our sins. But God exercised a little something called grace. You're saved by grace. That is undeserved merit. He doesn't need to save us. He doesn't need to prevent us from going into the lake of fire, but he wants to. That's the mystery of the gospel. So Jesus Christ came into the world, the sinless Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, the most beautiful, spotless, sinless human life ever to be lived. And he was taken, ordained of God, mind you, by wicked hands, crucified and slain. And as he hung on that cross, he bare our sins in his body there, and he paid our sin debt in full. You're saved by grace. By grace, God did that through faith now. Faith, here's where faith comes into it. You've got to believe with your heart that he really did that, and he did it for you personally, for you. He just didn't do it for some people. He did it for you too. And your sin debt has been paid in full by the precious blood of Jesus, Son of God. You believe that with your heart of hearts, and you confess that to him. I believe in you. I trust you. Save me too. Wash me clean. Make a home in heaven for me, Jesus. You know, if you'll say something like that and really mean it, he'll save you. He will make you something new, fresh, born again. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's mysterious. But it's, it's, it's God's promise to us. And you receive the saving benefits of what he did on that cross by faith. This is why faith is so important. We've got to talk about faith today. Paul says in Romans 5, that you are justified by faith. Now you have access to God. You have peace with God, Paul says. Through faith, through faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Wh whatever else you may be doing right in this world, maybe you give to the poor, uh, maybe you volunteer at a soup kitchen, uh, maybe you pay your taxes on time, uh, you're a good neighbor, whatever, whatever else we might be doing, friends, if we don't have faith in God, in Christ, we can't please God. You can't please Him. 
And Hebrews, the fourth chapter, reminds us that God rescued his covenant people Israel from bondage of slavery in Egypt. He got them out with supernatural sign miracles, and he preached them the life-saving word of truth. God gave them the gospel in embryonic form, to be sure, but he gave them his self-disclosure in revelation, and they could exercise saving faith in God at that time. And you know what? The saving word profited them nothing. And most of them, their carcasses dropped in the wilderness. Why? Because the writer goes on to tell you, because that saving word was not mixed with faith, there was no faith there. That's important. It's important that we understand what faith is. Don't you agree? See, I've set that all up. Now we all agree. Oh, I'm glad he's talking about faith now. It seems to be a very important thing. <laughs> it is very important. Well, before we start looking at what faith is, can we, uh, can we really come to an agreement here, an understanding of what, what faith is not? Because this is the caricature you get of faith out there in the world. They'll tell you, number one, that faith is forcing yourself to believe something you know isn't true. I think it was Mark Twain who said it. He said, faith is believing what you know ain't so. <laughs> that is not faith. That is not faith in the biblical sense. Uh, some sort of self-induced brainwashing effort to force yourself to believe something you know deep down is ridiculous nonsense. That is not Christian faith, friends. Don't let the world uh, present some kind of a caricature of your faith and mine. That is not faith. Number two, faith is not against, it's not uh, antagonistic to, it's not in collision with reason. Faith and reason are twin blessings from God. They work together. And we got this ridiculous idea that our detractors, our most notably would be our atheist detractors, they have somehow decided that science is their ally and that they are men and women of reason. And being so reasonable, they understand that science is the only real way to acquire genuine knowledge, you see. But they are reasonable people. But we, on the other hand, we're people of faith. Childish, sad, gullible people. I mean, that's what you get out there. I mean, this is, that is not anything like the true picture here. <laughs> faith is not against reason. Reason's not against faith. God is the wellspring from which both blessings flow. Faith can't be against reason. <laughs> God's own thinking sets the standard of right reason, and God has orchestrated a plan whereby it is through faith that you're saved. How could faith possibly be against reason in a Christian context? Impossible. So let's, do, do we understand all this? I mean, let's, let's come to a clear understanding here. Well, what is faith? Well, let's turn now, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and I want to share some, some really important and interesting things with you. I, I think this might be new to you, when I was doing my graduate work, I had to write a paper on faith and reason. And I, as I did my research, and went into the Greek and read all these different scholars, I was amazed at just how brilliant the, the authors of the Bible really were. These are not childish, unthinking people. These are brilliant people who are so brilliant, they can articulate something that is profound to you in a very simple way. And if you're not careful, you'll think those are simple-minded people because they've just articulated something simply. Don't ever get hoodwinked into thinking that. It's like the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, 31 verses explaining how the whole world was created. It's written simply for us so we can understand. And what do people do? They say, oh, how childish. They don't seem to understand. No, a supernatural intelligence is behind the whole thing, and he knows how dumb we are, so he writes it very clearly so you can't misunderstand. And what do we do? <laughs> oh, this is so simple. This is so childish. It must be a fairy tale. I mean, that, that's what, that's what, that is what the unregenerate mind will get you, right? Well, let's look at Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Just one verse we're going to look at here, okay, to start with. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There, is that clear? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, let's just be honest here. You read that, and, and what do you come away with? From a superficial reading, 
you come away thinking, well, I've just read something that's very flowery. <laughs> it's very flowery sounding, but it's very vague. It doesn't really say anything. Do you, you kind of feel that way? I mean, deep down, we have a faith commitment to God that this text is saying something. It's just sort of hard to grasp what it might be. It sounds nice, but it doesn't seem to convey any real information. Faith, what do you mean? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, this is God's invitation to you and me to go a little deeper in our Bible study. Look deeper at, if you don't understand what it means, that's Jesus calling you close to himself, saying, well, come close, dear child, and I'll explain this to you. I want you to know, after all. I mean, he wrote this stuff down so that we would get understanding. The Greek word for faith is the word pistis. Pistis. I'm not saying a rude thing up here. <laughs> I'm giving you that Greek word. What does that mean? Is that, is that signifying a blind, irrational jump into the darkness? Well, no. You check ancient Greek usage of that word. Pistis refers to that which you have become convinced of. I be I'm believing in something because I've become convinced of it. That implies deliberation. That implies a real engaging of your rational faculties. Christian faith is not, I'll say it again, some kind of blind, irrational, ridiculous jump into the darkness. It is us putting our, our trust in God, and we've thought it through. We've done like Jesus said. We've, sit, we've sat down, and we've, we've calculated the cost. We've thought about this. We've become convinced that this is reasonable. This is not a jump into the darkness. But notice this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now, what does that mean? You think of a substance, you think of some scientific experiment, don't you? You think, oh, that guy's got some kind of substance there in the test tube. Or you're thinking of something solid. When you think of substance, you're thinking of something solid. But the Greek word hypostasis refers to real being, the nature of something, okay? Now, I have two dumb cats at home. I got a big dumb gray one and a little dumb striped one. <laughs> two cats, two individuals. They're quite distinct in their temperament, attitude. But guess what they share in common? Their cat nature. They both share the nature of what we might call cat nests. They have that nature. They share it. That's what makes them cats, two members of a class called cat. This room is filled with persons, human persons. We're all distinct, aren't we? And yet we share a human nature. Our nature is human. The word hypostasis refers to nature, substance or nature. That's sort of a non-material reality, but it's real. Real being, actual existence, hypostasis. But it also refers to confidence, the, the ground or the confidence that you have, your assurance, same word, same word. So faith, in a biblical sense, would be that which apprehends reality. Catching that? Faith is that which apprehends reality. I'm in contact. Faith is the bridge between me and what's really real out there. Faith is not some, believing in what you know isn't true. Faith is apprehending what is really real. You say, well, what's the difference between that and knowledge then? Isn't knowledge apprehending what's real? Oh, Faith has a volitional aspect to it. Did you catch it? It's the substance of things hoped for. Oh, I'm engaging the will here. I'm hoping for some things. I'm desiring some things in the future. Faith is my assurance those things are coming in a biblical sense. They are coming. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the confidence, the assurance that the things I'm hoping for are going to be mine one day. And these are, as a matter of fact, the sure promises of God. God has made some promises to those who have exercised saving faith in him, and he is going to make good on those promises. You have apprehended that. And I'm going to punch this home. I'm going to articulate this in even stronger fashion as the text goes on. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, or the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Did you catch that? The evidence of things not seen. Now, what does that mean? Well, here you're getting some Hebrew parallelism. This is, a, this is a book written to the Hebrews, isn't it? 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for means exactly the same as the evidence of things not seen. God, throughout the scriptures, will tell you something important one way. Guess what? He'll turn around and tell you the exact same thing again. Different words this time. Why? So that his message to you is not garbled or lost. God is very, very intelligent, you know. He says, I'm going to tell you like this, and if you don't get it, I'll tell you like that. Just to make sure you understand that we, uh, we are getting a message here from God that he really wants you to grasp. It's important. The things not seen are the things you're hoping for. You're hoping for them because just because you can't see them, see? But look at the word evidence here. The evidence of things not seen. Now that is very, very significant. You've got to go back to old Bibles to understand what's being said here. Do you, who remembers the prophet Jeremiah? Remember Jeremiah, the weeping prophet? <laughs> Jeremiah 32 the prophet was instructed by God to purchase a tract of land. God said, Jeremiah, you're going to purchase that property. Jeremiah said, yes, Lord. Jeremiah purchased the property. And you know what he got? He got a scroll. Here's your scroll, Jeremiah. This is a legal document. This is the title deed to the land you've just purchased. Now you have objective evidence. You can pull out the scroll and say, that land is mine. I've got the title deed. But in the old King James Bible and in the Reformation Bibles, you know what the word for title deed is? Evidence. Put, take the evidence, Jeremiah. Put it in a safe place. Put it in a clay jar or something. In the book of Revelation, chapters 4 and 5, you read about a mysterious, powerful scene in heaven where God the Father sits on the throne and in his hand is a seven-sealed scroll. And everybody's crying in heaven. Nobody, no one is worthy. None of the sons of Adam can approach God and take that scroll from the Father's hand and open it. And one of the angelic messengers tells John, the revelator, don't cry. We found somebody. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has prevailed. And Jesus takes the scroll from his Father's hand and opens the scroll. That scroll, many believe and I believe, is the evidence the title deed to planet Earth, to the created order. He purchased it back with his own blood. See? But it's called the evidence in Scripture. The evidence. Take the evidence. Put it someplace safe. The title deed is the evidence. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, things not seen. It is your title deed to the promises of God. God's made promises to those who love and trust Jesus. You say, I've done that, Lord. My faith, therefore, becomes my title deed to the things he's promised me. That is significant. I mean, that's powerful. That's your objective evidence. In the high courts of heaven, that's your objective evidence before God. God will say, why should I let you in my heaven? And if we can say anything at all, we'll say, not on my own merits, Lord, I have none. But I have faith in Jesus. He's as great as the Bible says he is. He did for me what the Bible says he did. My faith becomes a title deed to all the things that God has promised those who love and trust him. The sure promises of God, yours and mine through faith. But I want us to un understand something here, that faith is not mere e intellectual assent. It's not nodding your head to a couple of propositions. Someone says, well, there's a, you know, I believe God created the world. You believe God created the world? And you nod your head. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Uh, Jesus is the Son of God. You nod your head. Yeah, yeah, okay. But that is not saving faith. That is not saving faith at all. That, is, that brings us to this amazing distinction, an infinite distinction, between believing that and believing in. It is, it's the difference between going to heaven or going to hell. See? If some, let's say I bought a car from auction, which I did and I take it to the mechanic, the, the official government inspector, and he looks at my car and says, all four brakes are shot. This car is unsafe. If you try driving this car home, people better stay off the sidewalks because all four brakes are not working, okay? So you gotta get those brakes fixed. Now I believe that Dan Peters is a great mechanic. I believe that he can fix my brakes for me. 
but I'm not leaving in Dan to do it until I tow that vehicle onto his lot and I ask him to get under that car and fix those brakes. And the next time I drive that car, every time my foot goes on the brake pedal, I'm sort of putting my faith in Dan, right? In Dan. I no longer believe that he can do something. I believe in him to do something. That's called active trust. That's, that's the difference here. Faith is not just believing that something is true. It's actively trusting in that something or someone. Do you see the difference? Profound difference here. Well, believing in God, friends, placing active trust in God, our faith in Him, leads to some very amazing blessings for you and me. And this is not going to turn into some health and wealth prosperity gospel something here. I promise you that. If that happens, you go find the cane and yank me off this platform here. Let's rejoice in the promises God has actually made, not the ones that people make for him. Okay, you ready? Drop down to verse 3. Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, or the old King James, not made of things which do appear. Read that again and think about it. By faith we understand that by the word of God... The worlds were framed so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith we understand. That is absolutely profound, is life-changing. It is, as they say, a game-changer intellectually, philosophically. By faith we understand. It's not like we use reason to understand and faith will kick in where reason lets us down. That is not this, this is not how it works. It is by faith you understand. Faith is the foundation from which proper reasoning can proceed. Faith is foundational to all this. Think about it. You ask anybody, believer or non-believer, tell me something you know. And he'll tell you something. I know X. Oh, do you? How do you know that? Oh, because uh, it, it was proved to me by Y. Oh, how, well, how do you know Y is real? Because of Zed, Zed proved why to me. Whatever these things are. Are you getting the picture that this just cannot go on infinitely? You just can't keep going back and back and back and back justifying things you believe. The process has to start somewhere or you know nothing. Zero. You know where the process starts? With an ultimate faith commitment to something. Everybody has unquestioned presuppositions. We all do believer in Jesus or not. Everybody has them. Unquestioned presuppositions, ultimate faith commitments. It's sort of like, you know, lots of parents here. Your child, your little, your toddler asks you, why? You tell them something and they say, why? So you answer that, well, blah, 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 right? And then they say, well, why that? And then you answer that one, well, why? And on it goes until finally what happens? Because I said so. That's how that ends. Ready? <laughs> God is for the world our because I said so. And I think nothing else will do. I mean, everybody has ultimate faith commitments. It's just that if your ultimate faith commitments are something other than the God of the Bible, it will be hopelessly inadequate to justify any truth claim you want to make for yourself. You've got to start your thinking with an ultimate faith commitment in the one who is alone maximally great, and that is the God of the Bible. He has the supreme right to be believed and obeyed just because he is God. He is eternal, uncreated, all-knowing, all-powerful, morally perfect. He loves you, and he loves me, and he doesn't deceive his people. He doesn't lie to people. He doesn't play games with them. He is the only appropriate place to put your ultimate faith commitment in Him, the true and living God. Nothing else will do. He created the world. He's in charge of the world. He makes sure the sun comes up and the sun goes down. He makes sure objects fall out of your pocket, they hit the ground. They don't go floating away to the ceiling. He has guaranteed in His Word law-like regularity in the created order just so you can manage in this life. So you can make plans for tomorrow. 
so you can learn real things, so you can progress through this life. So what if he's not your ultimate faith commitment? What if you want to deny God? Well, all you have, friends, is a world then. Well, I've got a world. Okay, that's great. What is it? How did it get here? What guarantee do you have that tomorrow will be like today, that there will be law-like regularity, that you could learn any one thing? Tell me. Silence from the non-believer. Oh, we're told today, this, this is very popular today, super saturated as we are with Eastern religious philosophy. All things are connected. All things are one. Isn't that nice? We're all on the same team. All is one. We're all connected. All religions are basically the same. The connectedness of all things. Let's all get along. I want to say if all things are connected, the way the monists, the way the Eastern philosophers, the way the New Agers and the rest want to maintain, then you would need to know everything to know anything. If everything is connected the way they say, everything is defined in terms of everything else, you would need to know everything in order to know anything. Anybody here know everything? No. The Christian says, I have a, prob I have a way out of this problem. I have a solution to the problem. You ready for this one? I don't know everything, but I know the God in heaven, the one who does know everything, and he informs me. He informs us. He gave us a word, infallible. He gave us our rational and cognitive faculties. He gave us reliable senses, minds, memories. My ultimate faith commitment is to him. I trust him for these things. Now I can justify the knowledge claims I want to make and the moral claims I want to make, all rooted in God. See? And now all of a sudden we have a different take on faith, don't we? It is the necessary foundation upon which all right reasoning must proceed. And it's got to be a faith in him, though. And we live in a world that puts a premium on faith. Some do. And people are putting their faith in their faith. <laughs> You've forgotten something. It's not your faith that's primary. It's the object of your faith. It's the triune God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You've got to put your faith in him. Your faith is worthless except for the fact that he has chosen, mind you, to respond to your faith. Get it? Our faith is worthless if not for the fact that God Almighty says, I will acknowledge your faith. I will take, rec take recognition of it. I will bless you for it. It's not the faith that is primary. It's the God of heaven who created this world who has chosen freely to respond to our faith. See? The object of your faith, it matters. It doesn't matter how strong your faith is. If it's in the wrong thing, it won't help. I like, in, well, in Canada, <laughs> I'm going to speak our language here, you can walk across a frozen lake that's 10 feet thick, but maybe you don't know it's 10 feet thick, and you only have a tiny little mustard seed of faith that you're going to walk across the, and safely get to the other side. It's okay. That tiny mustard seed of faith was enough to get you across the lake. You didn't need to have great faith. You just needed a little bit, enough to move those legs of yours. But what if you had tremendous faith that the ice is going to hold you, and meanwhile, it's only two millimeters thick? All the faith in the world won't get you across. You're going right to the bottom. It's important that our, our faith is placed in the right place, in God in a person, a person who created this world, who has plans and purposes for the world, who has made some promises to you and to me. That's where your faith is placed, ultimately, primarily, foundationally, him first, him first. And real faith in God now, love-trust relationship with him, leads to fantastic blessings, like real knowledge that you can justify. It leads to the saving of our souls and the forgiveness of sin and peace with God and our being reconciled to God. There is no well-being, friends, for me or you if we're estranged from God. How could there be? He is the very locus and paradigm of moral goodness. How can you live your life 
estranged from him and think that you're going to have one happy day. I mean, a real happy day where you have real peace and real joy with the real fruit of the Spirit being exemplified in your life. Forget it. Impossible. It can't happen. By faith or through faith, we have peace with God, reconciliation to Him. We enjoy the new birth. You become spiritually something different. I'm something different. I look back on my life before I knew Jesus. I can't believe how ridiculously stupid I was. Now, even to this day, I really know next door to nothing. But back then, I was wandering in the darkness and loving it, thinking I was having a happy life, and I was living for nothing. Ridiculous nonsense. But with the new birth comes new perspectives, new purposes, and new hope for the future. Those are the blessings that you access from God through faith. Through faith, you see? And someone might ask the question, and I've asked it in the past, why faith? Why does God choose to respond to faith of all things? Why doesn't he respond to brilliance <laughs> or any other thing? Why is it that God said, I will save you by faith through, or by grace through faith? Why, why did he do it that way? Why is it set up like this? And I'm going to offer you my opinion on this one. You ready for this? Because the free exercise of faithlessness is what got us into this big mess in the first place. God told Adam and Eve, you eat from that tree, you will die. There'll be judgment and death. He told Adam, he entrusted that message to Adam to tell Eve. And they were both supposed to believe God. Why? Because of God's own authority. <laughs> His word is self-authenticating. It carries its own credentials. God said it. You say, yes, Lord. I'm not going to question you. How could I? God's word is the thing that I use to question everything else. <laughs> it was grave error for Eve to think in her mind, well, God said that and Satan says that. I guess I will become the judge of what's real and I will conduct an experiment. Wrong. Bad idea. Faithlessness in what God had said. And that ran away, that snowballed into this unspeakably horrible, nightmarish problem we're in right now. A world supersaturated with sin and its devastating effects. It was faithlessness that got us into this horrible mess. I just have the idea that God said it'll be faith that pulls you out. God has come into the world in the person of his son, Jesus, the last Adam. And he's got a message for us. And he says, if you'll believe me, you will exercise active trust in me and we'll enter into this love-trust relationship. I will fix this problem first in your life and then this problem as it exists right now in the whole created order. God will purge one day all things that offend from his created order. As a matter of fact, when I listen to Jesus talk, he says those who have hated him and have rejected him, they will be cast out for eternity into what? outer darkness. It's like these people are not even part of the created order. They're not even regarded as being part of the universe anymore. They are cast out into outer darkness. And it's as though in God's economy, he's going to create a brand new heavens and earth wherein dwells righteousness forever and the wickedness of days gone by don't even come to mind for God's faithful those who have loved him and trust him. And we will dwell in that place in righteousness and holiness, beholding the face of Jesus who sits on the throne. We will worship and serve him. We will learn from him. And in every saint of God, ever increasing love and appreciation for the one who loved us first. That is the heritage of God's people. And it is our faith commitment today to that that God is going to honor and he will bless us with such things. Our title deed we hold up, my faith, your faith. God gives us now confidence that despite outward appearance, perhaps, he is for us, he's not against us, he is with us always, even to the end of the age, and he has things planned for us we can't possibly begin to imagine. Wonderful things. Paul said it, 
Eye has not seared, seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those who trust him, those who love him. And friends, we want to be among those faithful believers today. We want to trust God for his tremendously great promises. Why don't we have a word of prayer together? We'll ask God to increase our faith, to seal the truths we've been confronted with into our hearts. And May's going to lead us after we're done praying in a final chorus, okay? Let's put our hearts together here spiritually and let's come to God. Almighty God, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your precious word, the Bible. Thank you for your holy word, a sacred library that shines like a light in a dark place, and the world is a dark place. Thank you, God, for your word that informs us about the world, about us, about who you are, and about how fallen man may be right how he may be reconciled to a holy God. Thank you, God, for your teachings today, for clarifying in our hearts and minds what real faith is. And Lord, may we be found by you to be people who exercise strong, saving faith, moment by moment, believing you, trusting you for your great promises, God. We want to be a powerful church in these last of days. Put it in our hearts and minds, God, now to knit us together, to work together, to do something of significance in this world while we're here. Our lives are but a vapor. And we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. With the moments that we're here, God, put us together to work as a church family, to do something that will honor you and will attract myriads of people to the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, hear this prayer. We send it up from our hearts. Make it acceptable now in Jesus Christ, your beloved one. Intercede for us, Holy Spirit. May God the Father sitting on the throne hear and acknowledge these prayers and answer them in spectacular ways that will thrill our hearts and will honor him in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise our holy God. And God bless you all.